This is NHTV2, North Haven Government Television, a service of North Haven Community Television. The following program is brought to you through the support of the town of North Haven. Good evening, everyone. I'm Mike Fried in North Haven's first selectman, and welcome to our town budget presentation for this evening. I'm here at Town Hall this evening. Our superintendent of schools, Patrick Sterk, I'll be introducing shortly, who will be presenting the Board of Education budget first, and then he will be answering the questions that have been submitted by the public. And then after Patrick concludes, I will then present the town budget and take the time to answer the questions that the residents have submitted. You know, ladies and gentlemen, these are different times. They're unprecedented times that have presented unprecedented challenges and have presented unprecedented uncertainty. But through it all, there is going to be an unprecedented level of hope for all of us. We will get through these challenging times. Tonight's presentation is a good example of the ad ad adaptation we've had to make here in terms of trying to present a town budget and a board of ed budget that would normally be handled in a public forum at North Haven High School. I thank you for joining us this evening. Over the course of the next 90 minutes to two hours perhaps, we will present to you the budget and we will once again answer all of the questions that have been submitted. So now, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our outstanding superintendent of schools, Mr. Patrick Sterk. Please look at the monitors, ladies and gentlemen. Patrick is on the phone. He'll be presenting the slides that you're about to see. Patrick, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Frieda. Good evening, town of North Haven. Tonight, I will be presenting the Board of Education's proposed budget for the 2020 2021 school year. I want to preface this presentation by stating that this recommendation is our most realistic budget for the 2020-2021 school year. I recognize that it is not realistic to recommend a six plus percent increase, which is where we began this process. We have spent time with building principals and department directors to reduce wherever possible while ensuring that we are meeting all obligations and staying true to the district's mission. Special education is the most unpredictable and fluid area of the budget because it is dependent on student need. This is the area with the greatest number of variables and is, it is vitally important to project accurately. No matter how accurate we project, the biggest unknown is the amount of money we will receive from the state in the excess cost reimbursement. The budget process is one of the most important tasks the district and the Board of Education take on to reach the objectives within our mission statement. Our draft mission statement is as follows. It is the mission of the North Haven Public Schools in collaboration with students, parents, and community to develop responsible, educated, and productive global citizens who can thrive in an ever-changing digital world. A vision statement focuses on tomorrow and the expectations the Board of Education has for all students. As a result of their experiences in the North Haven Public Schools, every student will acquire the skills necessary to meet the demands of the 21st century and leave the district college and career ready. In pursuing this mission and vision, we believe we must provide opportunities for all students to independently, collaboratively, and creatively solve rigorous everyday problems. Honor and value empathy and compassion for all individuals throughout our diverse community. Support all students in making strong and positive contributions to their community. Provide all students with a safe learning environment to explore their strengths and vulnerabilities to develop self-worth. And support each other in times of challenge. In this pursuit, we are incredibly sensitive to, the broad, to both the broad educational needs of our students and the town's resources we are expending to address those needs. In creating this budget recommendation, 
we were committed to maintaining these priorities. Maintain the district's focus on improving achievement for all students, meet all contractual obligations, meet the new 2023 graduation requirements, address the social and emotional needs of all learners by beginning to increase the level of support services within our schools and district programs, and demonstrating sensitivity to both the broad educational needs of our students, as well as the town's resources we are expending to address those needs. The proposed budget, budget provides the following, resources to educate 3,147 students, mental health, nutrition, and medical care to allow students to access instruction. Specialized services required for all students to meet their potential. Diverse opportunities for students to engage in activities outside of their curricular pursuits and transportation from school. So there are many internal and external factors that drive the budget each year. Internally, student enrollment, contractual increases, special education, and medical benefits all play a part. Student enrollment has been rather steady for the past three or four years. The district contracts were set for this current fiscal year. However, the district's transportation contract is ending this year, as well as our clerical and paraprofessional union contract. Each will be negotiated soon. We have also reviewed many vendor contracts, especially around student services, to find potential savings. I will review additional savings later in this pre presentation. Externally, the state of the state, state and federal education revenue, and state and federal mandates play a role as well. Overall, the state has been rather quiet in regards to mandates, but the big question every year is the district special education excess cost reimbursement which plays a huge role in the budgeting process. North Haven's per pupil expenditure or average cost per student is ranked 11th of 24 in district reference group D. The district is consistently in the middle of the pack within our DERG. And as you will see in the next slides, North Haven sees a great return on their investment. North Haven provides their students a strong education at an excellent value. The district has talented teachers and other professionals that dedicate their lives to this work. We wisely use our resources to get the most out of our funds and this dedication and budget savviness is reflected in our accomplishments. The average per pupil expenditure for Dirk D is $17,146. North Haven spends $162 less per student per year than this average. Our budget will cost the town $506,898 more per year if we spent the average Dirk D per pupil expenditure. North Haven's currently ranked 29th best school district in Connecticut. Only three Dirk D districts were recognized in the top 30. The other two districts are Old Saybrook, who currently ranks number one in per pupil expenditure within our DERG, and East Lyme, who is in the, in the middle of the pack, like North Haven. North Haven High School was also named to the College Board's 10th Annual Advanced Placement District Honor Roll. Additionally, we have been able to provide cutting edge instructional practices and a wide range of course offerings at the secondary level. For the past five years, Teachers, teachers College Reading and Writing Program has provided professional development for teachers at all all four elementary schools. The secondary level offers a wide range of elective offerings, culinary, computer assisted design, automotive, and the application of technology across many medias. There are also dual enrollment programs with Gateway Community College where students can leave high school with college credit. I have always suspected that a quality school system is somehow tied to housing prices. And as you look around Connecticut, you can see that the towns that have the highest home values are considered to have a high quality school system. I looked into a few studies and discovered that researchers have found that there are strong ties between home values and a quality school system. The study that spoke to me most was conducted by Sayo and Simons. They found that various measures of school quality have a substantial impact on housing prices. 
it's not just one measure such as test scores that can affect home values. It can be the programs we offer, class size, or that North Haven is ranked high as an overall school district. The 2019-2020 approved budget is $54,590,313. The Board of Education's proposed budget for the 2020-2021 school year is $57,324,245. The requested increase for the 2020-2021 school year is $2,733,000. $932. This reflects a 5% increase. I recognize that this increase is higher than in past years. However, as you will see in the upcoming slides, that the increase will meet our contractual obligations, health care benefits, and tuition increases for special education. There are no new programs or positions included with this increase. We have worked hard on the front end to present a reasonable and respectful budget. The budget increase has been significantly reduced prior to this presentation by eliminating positions, utilizing instructional supplies more efficiently, and reducing facilities and IT budget lines. Honestly, I have no intention of requesting this high of an increase in the future. However, I believe it is my responsibility to maintain the services that are in place within the district, and this increase will do just that. This slide reflects the major drivers to the budget. These areas total a 6.2% increase, which is significantly higher than the recommended increase of 5%. There is a change to the health insurance benefits line, and I will discuss it in greater length on the next slide. Also, for reference, 87.7% .7 of the total budget is committed to salaries, benefits, transportation, and tuition. As we look at contractual wage increases, they have a 2.5% step up, which is an additional $1,364,663. As it stands, North Haven's average teacher salary is $68,853. This is below the Dirk D average of $70,924. To add a little more perspective to teacher salaries, North Haven currently ranks 18 out of 24 within our Dirk for initial teacher salary and 17 out of 24 for maximum teacher salary. Our initial projections for the renewal of our health benefits was 6%. However, it increased significantly back in January to 12.8% or $964,000. This was due to numerous and rather substantial claims. Since then, the new renewal rate has dropped $156,000 to stand at $808,000. Special education saw a 1.2% increase due to out-of-district tuitions and transportation increases. The professional tech services line also grew to meet the needs of students who require additional support. As I stated earlier in the presentation, we have taken significant steps in order to reduce the overall increase while still maintaining high quality services to all students. The administrative staff has been reconfigured in order to eliminate an assistant principal position at the middle school. We have also eliminated a district coordinator position. The elimination of these positions, as well as potential retirements, gave us approximately $315,000 in savings. We were able to reduce our utility costs by $50,000 based on historical data around our natural gas usage. The current school year, this current school year, the district is contracting out speech and language pathologist and occupational therapist through Cheshire Fitness Zone. These services cost the district $322,000 annually. Beginning next school year, we will hire an occupational therapist and two speech and language pathologists. These hires will create an estimated savings of $160,000. Additionally, we plan to shift to one vendor for registered behavior technicians and behavioral analysts. This shift Will represent an estimated savings of $100,000. Lastly, we reduced both 
the facilities and IT budget lines by a total of $82,445. Although these lines were reduced, we recognize and are very grateful that the town has bonded $2 million to upgrade security at all of our schools. In closing, this budget recommendation is higher than I'd hoped to present. However, it is a realistic view of what is needed to operate the school district next year at a status quo level. In short, a perfect storm is hitting the budget in the form of higher health insurance costs and correcting for under budgeting. Through this increase, we honor all contractual obligations and are able to maintain all services. This concludes the Board of Education presentation. I will now ans answer questions from the North Haven community. The first group of questions is from Nancy Barrett. Question, the proposed 2020-2021 town budget cuts $200,000 from the Board of Ed budget that you presented at the Board of Ed workshop. Will you be able to absorb this $200,000 reduction without negatively impacting educational opportunities? And if so, where are you cutting expenses? Can you live with this reduction, especially in light of the BOE monthly reports from November through January, warning of a potential BOE budget deficit due to underfunded line items and a spike in unexpected special education costs. As of March 31st, the Board of Education budget is 96.9% .9 used, expended, plus encumbrances. Will this proposed BOE budget increase of $2,733,932 accommodate any other unforeseen expenses, including the unreimbursed costs associated with special ed student movement into or out of our town in mid fiscal year? So our answer, the Board of Ed will be able to absorb the $200,000 reduction within the, the health insurance line item $156,000 came off the most up-to-date renewal quote, and the remainder can be handled through the health insurance account. Based on the recent bid that was completed through the ACES Insurance Collaborative, fees were significantly reduced, and therefore the health insurance expense, expense for fiscal year 21 is expected to reduce accordingly. Yes, the board will be able to live with this reduction, and it will not impact educational opportunities. This increase does not accommodate for unforeseen movement for students in special education. This increase meets all obligations and keeps the district at a status quo level. Next question from Ms. Barrett. There were several line items that were mistakenly omitted from the current fiscal year Board of Ed budget. Those line items, bus monitors, open choice, preschool, et cetera, were appropriated at the $0 level and to date collectively have required $2,692,367 in transfers and adjustments. Where did this money for transfers and adjustments come from in order to create a revised budget and cover year-to-date expenditures and encumbrances? If the answer is state and federal grants, then why do you need to increase the Board of Ed budget funded by the North Haven taxpayers by 5%. The answer to this question about the Board of Ed budget funding sources in the current fiscal year will shed light on the proposed Board of Ed budget for the next fiscal year. So here's our answer. Yes, there were several line items mistakenly omitted from the current fiscal year. They included bus monitors, teacher contractual course reimbursements, adult education, central office accounts for supplies, post postage, printing, and professional development, and underfunding for SPED, special education tuition increases, electricity costs, and pension obligations for an estimated total of approximately $1.4 million. It did not include open choice or preschool. None of these expenses were funded by the state or federal grants. Savings in other areas such as teacher salaries, natural gas, unemployment, cleaning services due to a favorable bid, favorable bid, and from the spending freeze implemented early on in the school year allowed the district to offset these budget issues. 
In addition, some of the accounts that were not budgeted were reevaluated and the district simply did not make any of those purchases. As the fiscal year 21 budget was developed, evaluation of every account occurred and all necessary accounts were funded. The board's recommendation for fiscal year 21 represents a realistic view of what the school district needs to operate at a status quo level. And while reductions were necessary in all areas, we made every effort to reduce in areas that would be least impactful to our students. The next question is from Sally Buemi. For the current fiscal year, what is the financial impact? What financial impact will the pandemic have on potential surplus for the BOE budget? I realize there must be additional expenses, but aren't there also significant reduced costs for areas like certified substitute teachers, electric, gas, and heat, transportation and athletic expenses. This analysis is critical to effectively evaluate the proposed Board of Ed budget for fiscal year 2021. Answer, the pandemic has created, has impacted the current fiscal year budget with savings in the areas of substitutes, overtime, mileage reimbursement, professional and staff development, and field trip transportation. We also anticipate savings in regular transportation and utilities. However, there have also been offsetting costs. Additional cleaning services and supplies such as hand sanitizer and PPE for staff who are still working in our schools, legal services, computer costs, and distance learning costs. Health insurance is also another cost due to additional employees having come onto the district's health insurance as a result of a spouse's, uh, spouses who have lost their jobs. Uh, in addition to that, lost pre-K tuition and other revenues. This group of questions are from Kim Braun. Question, in Ms. Anderson's memorandum on January 16th, 2020, she states, North Haven is below the mean for both state and DERG D funding per pupil, as well as below the median in state per pupil funding and right at the median for DERG funding levels. The data given was of Connecticut school districts, 90 schools fund more per pupil and 78 fund less. Of our district reference group D, 11 districts fund more and 12 fund less. What are the other districts in DERG D? Here's our answer. The other DERG D districts are as follows. Um, there's 23 of them or 24 of them. So um, Berlin, Bethel, Brantford, Clinton, Colchester, Cromwell, East Granby, East Hampton, East Lyme, Ledyard, Milford, Newington, New Milford, Old Saybrook, Rocky Hill, Shelton, Southington, Stonington, Wallingford, Waterford, Watertown, Weathersfield, and Windsor. Ms. Braun's next question, why can't we increase PP spending, particularly given the material increase in grand list revenue? Uh, our answer, the requested increase of 5% keeps the district at a status quo level. An attempt to increase per people spending will further increase our request. In correcting these under budgeted areas, we'll be able to ensure that all areas are properly funded for the future and direct all funds to moving the district forward. Uh, Ms. Braun's next question. In the same memo, Ms. Anderson states this budget is higher to maintain a status quo level and that they are hitting the budget in the form of correcting past under budgeting. What are these corrections? So our answer, these corrections include bus monitors, teachers contractual course reimbursements, adult education, central office accounts for supplies, postage, printing, professional development, and underfunding for special education student tuitions, electricity costs, and pension obligations. This question comes from Jennifer Caldwell. Question, what is the cost of, one, of the one-to-one -one device program of the school district, including the initial startup costs, as well as the cost of repair and replacement? Has the BOE looked at research regarding the effectiveness of one-to-one -one programs? Our answer. 
We have been able to implement the one-to-one -one program without substantial increase to the IT budget. We used to buy fewer high-end non-mobile devices and switch to more school-geared mobile devices at a fraction of the cost. We have also saved on printing costs with a one-to-one -one solution. We operate on a stable refresh schedule that provides us the ability to keep a full fleet of devices in good working order without regular budget increases. The entirety of the technology budget is around $1.2 million annually. Of that, approximately one quarter is for student devices and repairs to student devices. There are no significant startup costs as internal staff has done the setup, management, and maintenance of the program, as well as provided training for all teachers. There have been studies that show increased test scores and engagement levels for students in one-to-one -one districts who have invested in mindful implementation and provided training and support for teachers as North Haven has done. This next group of questions comes from Christy Huntley. Question, will the CARES Act monies offset a potential cut to the educational budget and in essence, cancel it out? So our answer, the CARES Act funding will provide the district an additional $213,713. The potential cut to the education budget will not affect our staff or students. The Board of Education will be able to absorb the $200,000 reduction within the health insurance line item. 156,000 came off the most up-to-date renewal quote and the remainder can be handled through the health insurance account. It is our understanding that the CARES Act funding will need to be used for specifically defined purchases and services to enhance educational opportunities for our students and cannot be used to supplant or reduce our fiscal year budget. Next question, how will the monies from the CARES Act be allocated? Can you offer assurances that money will be used for PPE, training for faculty regarding distance slash hybrid learning, student support, and other measures that directly impact student academic success? Our answer, the funds will be allocated by ensuring that all students have access to appropriate technology and connectivity, access to high quality curriculum that addresses the needs of all learners, including students with disabilities, addressing student learning gaps and safely reopening schools, as well as providing social and emotional supports for educators and students as they transition back to school. We will be tracking how these funds are distributed and will share it publicly during the district's monthly Board of Education meeting. Next question. What, if any, monies will be allocated to additional support services for students given the impact of this pandemic? Answer. The district will ensure that proper instructional and emotional supports are in place for our students for the 2020-2021 school year. Question. Will monies be used to support teachers over this summer as they prepare for fall, a fall start like no other. As we know, teachers are being expected to go above and beyond for their students, yet many do not have the necessary training to effectively teach through new modalities. Answer, yes. The district will support teachers as we prepare for this unique school opening. My leadership team and I are currently planning and taking part in virtual seminars to ensure that we are supporting our staff for our return in September. Teacher professional develop, development may be an acceptable expense through the CARES Act. However, we have not received guidance around this yet. Uh, Ms. Hunley's last question. Will there, will any educational consulting contracts be put out to bid ensuring monies are being used effectively while still ensuring quality? So here, our answer. The district evaluates all consulting contracts based on content, delivery, and price. Since they are not all comparable, a formal bid process is not always the best process, but we always ask for detailed specifications regarding the program and price quotes. So this was the last question. I thank you all for your time tonight and please take care. Thank you very much, Patrick. We appreciate your presentation very much and your detail. So ladies and gentlemen, now we're gonna take a two minute recess and then what we will do is come back and I'll be presenting the town side of the budget. Just bear with us for a couple of minutes. Thank you.
Okay, thank you very much. We're back here, and I'd like to now take some time to present the town side of the budget here this evening. So let's take a look at the fiscal year ending 2021 and the upcoming budget for presentation purposes tonight. When we look at the total town government with debt and capital needs, we see the town side of the budget with a dollar change of $2,520,260. We see the capital change of 51,000. And you see the total increment of $2,571,272. Now I'll be talking about this a little bit further on in the presentation here. A little over $1 million of that 2.57 million is due to the increase in debt service as a result of us paying down and assuming now the debt for our North Haven Police Department and our North Haven Middle School. So we're presenting this increment, 2571000 and I'll take you in further detail here. Patrick already spoke about the Board of Ed budget and the dollar change there and provided the reasons and answered the questions that members of the public submitted. When we look at the total recommended town and Board of Ed budget, the proposed budget is $109,091,154. You see the dollar change there, it's a little bit over 5%. When we take a look without the debt service factored in, when we look at the town budget and the Board of Ed budget, we see that 52.55% of the overall budget is the Board of Education, and on the town side, 47.45%. If we exclude the 6.4 million worth of debt, which is in the previous slide figures, so the town, if we, in effect, if the Board of Ed, like some districts do in some cities and towns, book the debt on the Board of Ed side, because the town is handling $6.4 million of Board of Education debt for the debt on the high school, for the debt now on the middle school, when we factor the debt in, it's 58.4% versus 41.6%. But the town always will carry the Board of Ed debt, unlike some other districts across the state of Connecticut. So let's take a look, ladies and gentlemen, at the capital. These are the capital requests. A 10 gigabyte network upgrade. We see the cost, 125,512. A fire suppression system requested by the fire chief. The total here on this slide, $159,512. If we look over at the police department, we see here three new cruisers being requested at $140,000. Every year we try to upgrade and update the police vehicles and then cycle out those that are old and are really uh, experiencing a lot of mileage and perhaps even repairs. So we're requesting three this coming fiscal year. Laptop computer replacements, $12,000. There's three of those that are being requested. Body armor for our policemen and police women, 22 for a total of 18,000. We see this emergency light bar and siren package, two of those very critical for our police department at 8,000. A AFIS fingerprint system for 8,000. And uh, for those animal lovers like myself, our animal shelter, it's a shelter that's starting to age. The roof is in very bad shape, and we're requesting the roof to be replaced, and the estimated cost will be $25,000. If we go back to the fire department, or to the fire department, station security, an upgrade there of $20,000. We are, it, we are we're encumbering this ladder truck lease at $211,000. Self-contained breathing apparatus for our firefighters, a lease on that at $80,000. A 
a fire station generator at 45,000, and a fire police dispatch software system at 110,000. These are all very important things for us as a town, for us as a fire department, and for us for overall public safety. Public works. We spoke with public works early on in January. They presented to us this field line marker system, the GPS system at 40,500, and the public works director presented to us that the payback on that investment will be significant because it'll dramatically reduce the time that's spent in lining the fields, whether it be baseball fields, lacrosse, soccer, whatever they may be, some of the town fields. So we've put that in the budget. And we had a problem with our jet vac. That's the truck, that's the system, ladies and gentlemen, that goes around and cleans out catch basins, perhaps clog lines. That's very, very important. It's a very expensive vehicle. We decided to do a lease on this at 70000 That's what you see here. That truck probably would have costed or cost four hundred and fifty to four hundred and seventy thousand dollars So by doing it as a lease, we can systematically book the lease every year and not incur the major expense in the first year. So the total capital being requested is $987,000. So what does this mean for us this coming year in terms of the mill rate and in terms of taxes? This year, ladies and gentlemen, was complicated by a statewide mandate every five years municipalities must conduct a reval. So we had a reval this year. And in any reval that every city and town does across the state of Connecticut, and all 169 cities and towns must do a reval every five years. In every reval, some properties go down and some properties go up in value. The ones that go up in value generally are a byproduct of two things comparable sales in the neighborhoods when houses go up for sale and are sold, and then also any upgrades that are made over a five-year period from the point of the last reval. So in other words, if someone puts a brand new deck on their house that happened two years after the last reval five years ago, well, that will catch up with itself in the reval that took place this year. So any upgrades in homes, it gets reflected in the new reval. So when we look at this, it presented a little bit of a complication for us this year because of that. However, what we're doing, ladies and gentlemen, is when we look at this budget, because we had a significant amount of top line revenue with new businesses coming in, Amazon was a major driving factor of that. And I had anticipated great grand list growth coming this coming year, and I'm hoping that once we get through this pandemic, I'll be able to resurrect those major projects that I've been involved with. And there were 37 of them before March 8th hit. So we're presenting here a 0.33 mill rate decrease. Now, ladies and gentlemen, all around us, municipalities are either raising taxes or trying to have a zero mill rate increase by inflating revenues. We don't do that. So I'm going to take you through the next couple of slides and show you that the mill rate that we're proposing with a 0.33 reduction brings the mill rate down to 30.85. Assuming that a house, an average house in North Haven, the gross value is $299,000, the net assessment of that home at the 70% assessed value would bring it to $209,300. Assuming that particular home that I'm showing you on this particular slide, that value stayed the same this year versus last year. For that particular home, the 0.33 mill rate increase 
would yield a $70 tax decrease for that home. The formula that sometimes can be confusing for residents trying to understand how the municipal mill rate system works, it's the value of the house, the fair market value, multiplied times 70% to yield the assessed value. And then the assessed value times 0 0.03085 in this case with the new mill rate that we are presenting and proposing. So let's take a look at the budget review in summary here. We spoke about the town side and the dollar change which you see there. Patrick clearly outlined the Board of Education side. The capital we spoke about, an increase of $51,000 the contingency remains the same at 300,000 and showing the 5.3 million. Our top line revenue offsets that 5.3 million. And we're still able to offer a 0.33 mill rate decrease. Recapping again, it adds 2.733 million to the Board of Ed. Patrick spoke about the reasons why. It adds 2.52 million to the town side. And again, a 1 million, a little bit over 1 million of that is the bonding debt increment for the police station and the middle school. This budget, ladies and gentlemen, actually increases the current level of service to our residents. And I'll talk about that in a moment. And again, the proposed mill rate decrease will go by down by 0.33 to 30.85. So in terms of increasing services to our residents, this budget that's being proposed will enhance public safety, police and fire, will offer significant and important and critical upgrades to our 911 dispatch system to create even greater efficiency in a more robust network, and it fully supports education. So what's next? Well, in accordance with the state of Connecticut and Governor Lamont's Executive Order 71, paragraph 13, that was issued on March 21st of 2020, the Board of Selectmen authorizes the Board of Finance as the town's budget making authority to adopt the budget for the next fiscal year starting July 1st and to set a mill rate that's sufficient to pay the, the town's expenses for the said fiscal year. So we're complying with the governor's executive order. The Board of Selectmen already voted to send this to the Board of Finance and the Board of Finance meeting will be next week in a teleconference call and that will be also here on North Haven TV. The date of that is May 20th. There will be no referendum this year in accordance with the governor's executive order. Out of 169 cities and towns, 168 are complying with this. One town, the town of Vernon, decided to do an electronic vote and um, there were some issues there, but I would rather not get into that tonight. But in our case, this will be the process. So now I had many questions and I'd like to take you through the questions. And what we've done here, ladies and gentlemen, is we've put the questions on the screen for you to see as I'm working through the questions. There are many questions here tonight. So let's start question by question. The first question is from North Haven resident Jerry Remillard. And the question is on page 32, what is the explanation for the disposal of recycled material increasing by 50%? Well, the answer to that question, ladies and gentlemen, is that this is a product, recyclables, that we once were getting paid to have it picked up. But because landfills were shut down, specifically in China, and because there's been an absence of landfills in other areas, including the United States, 
what was a product, recyclables, that we once got paid for started to skyrocket in terms of the cost of us getting rid of it. So the tipping fee on recyclables now is almost as much as the tipping fee on municipal waste. That's the answer to that. Is the expense related to individual household recycle or Elm Street facility? Both, Jerry. Both come into play on that. Question from Sherman Katz. Why didn't we consider doing an electronic vote by the legislative body versus the seven members of the BOF who have already approved the budget? Sherman, the, uh, the simple answer is, again, we wanted to comply with the governor's executive order. I'm not sure, to be quite candid, Sherman, how we could have done an electronic vote with the public. You know, we don't know who has internet, who has access, and to have, to have 16,000 registered, registered voters try to call in on a vote, it didn't give us enough time to really, to really try to think that through. So we decided to go with the governor's executive order. Thank you for the question. Mary White, long-standing long North Haven resident like Sherman Katz. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there's about 15 questions here from Mary, so I'll try to take it slowly. <clears throat> Some of the questions have multiple questions. So let's take the first one. What is the fund balance and what is the percentage? Mary, the fund balance right now is approximately 8.15% consistent with where we try to stay in terms of our fund balance. It's a very healthy fund balance that is represents about $8 million worth of, of fund balance savings. Mary's next question is, what is the rainy day fund amount that has been set aside? Now, I'm presuming the nature of that question is how much is being given back in this coming fiscal year. <clears throat> you know, ladies and gentlemen, we, we run surpluses many times. <coughs> Excuse me. So. In this year's budget, we are rolling over a million dollars of unrestricted fund balance into this coming year's budget. In effect, we always try to give a surplus or a large portion of it back to the taxpayers. Is it the same as the previous year or more or less? Mary, it's slightly less. Last year, I believe it was 1125000 This year, it's $1 million. Does it have a target use in the upcoming budget? No. It's listed on the revenue page, the income page, and it gets put into general revenue without a specific target in terms of a line item. <clears throat> the next question involves the fire department training facility. What is the approximate cost? That's undetermined right now. We ran into a couple of, uh, I don't want to say complications, but uh, the, state, the state building department has to weigh in on this. So we're unsure about the approximate cost of the, what the fire training facility will be. So Mary, I'm sorry I don't have an answer for you on that. However, I'll try to add some additional perspective uh, on that for you based on another question you had. Will the voluntary payment from Quinnipiac University be able to be utilized to help pay for the fire training facility? The answer is yes. We have about a quarter of a million dollars in Quinnipiac voluntary payment set aside for that project approved by Quinnipiac University. Would the town be able to assist if QU's voluntary payment portion <coughs> is not enough to cover the costs? The answer is no, not at this time. So we have to see where this comes in. We do not have a line item budget for that. If the fire department training facility project is not ready to go forth in the next budget period, can Quinnipiac's voluntary payment be utilized for amenities at the turf fields, things such as bleachers, concession stands, press box, et cetera? The answer right now is no. We are hoping that we can get a final cost on a fire training facility. We have earmarked for that the Quinnipiac quarter of a million dollars that was pre-approved by Quinnipiac University. 
we fully intend to build that fire training facility. In terms of future QU payments, I'll address that in a few moments. And actually, Mary asked the question here. Some of these questions, ladies and gentlemen, I'm seeing for the first time. So I see Mary's question, which is a good segue for me to answer what the future would be. Will the pandemic have an impact on Quinnipiac University's voluntary payment amount? Yes, that's the answer. Now, in this coming budget, we have moved from $300,000 to $200,000. And we're still hoping to be able to receive the 300000 that's in this current fiscal year budget. Now, with that being said, Quinnipiac's president, President Olian, has met with me many times, and we really enjoy the relationship we have with the university. That doesn't mean they won't contribute to community projects. So that is still on the table. QU likes the fact that history with us is that Yes, we have a revenue item for a portion of their voluntary payment, but we also apply a significant amount back into projects that have benefits, benefited school systems with Playscapes at Ridge Road School, Playscapes at, at Green Acres, Playscapes at Monoese. So there's been a great give back in terms of creating positive outcomes with a lot of the Quinnipiac voluntary payment down through the years. And I'll share a little bit more about that in a few moments. Continuing with some of Mary's questions here, we understand this would be the last year to have a chance at a grant for a fire truck. Has the paperwork been submitted or when will it be submitted? Will the town find out if it's awarded or not awarded the grant for the fire truck in the fall? Has the pandemic had an impact on the application date for this grant? The answer to these questions is that the grant paperwork was filed on or about March 18th by the town and the fire department, our fire chief, Paul Januszewski. The date that we will find out is October 20th, no later than October 20th, whether we'll receive the grant. And has the pandemic had an impact on the application date? No, the dates are still in place, Mary. We filed on or about March 18th, and by October 20th, we hope to have an answer, or we will have an answer either way. Continuing along with some of Mary's questions. Has a new budget line item been added for PPE, masks, gloves, et cetera, for all town employees other than the fire department and others who budget for? The answer to that question in this paragraph is no. Uh, many of the PPE equipment uh, we have purchased, we are booking it aside uh, in a separate line item expense. And what will happen is we'll submit it for a reimbursement with FEMA or to FEMA, who's committed to a 75% reimbursement on all, all pandemic or COVID-19 related expenses. Is the state or federal government providing PPE to the town employees or providing funding for it? There has been some, uh, yes, there has been some PPE provided by the state. Uh, a great job by Chief Paul Januszewski working with me to have our rec center as a repository, one of five across the state of Connecticut, where the National Guard and um, Demis, the Department of Emergency Management Services, are coordinating issuing PPE to uh, not only other municipalities, healthcare agencies, and all those who have registered to receive it. And also, ladies and gentlemen, we've had a lot of PPE, particularly masks and gloves, donated here. I mentioned this at one of my updates a couple of weeks ago, some of the generosity from our community. And um, that has been very, very helpful. So Mary asked, can the town consider a consortium of other towns to make bulk purchases for PPE and sanitizer, similar to the governors of New England State's consortium for ventilators and PPE? We haven't gotten there yet, Mary. However, we have a company here in North Haven who uh, has been great to work with that I've introduced to people from all over the state. And their business in North Haven has been booming 
because of the connections that we've made for them. And they were kind enough to offer us discounts on some of the products that we've ordered from them. The last question on this slide from Mary, can hand sanitizers be budgeted so as to be installed in all town buildings that do not currently have them, or do they all currently have them? So last month, Mary, I had hand sanitizers installed in all the buildings, in many locations, for the employees, um, multiple locations at each and every one of the buildings. Now keep this in mind, police and fire had hand sanitizers already. So at the Community Services Department, at the Annex, here at Town Hall, um, over at the Senior Center, the town buildings have all been equipped with uh, 750 milliliter hand sanitizers. So we've already done that. Continuing on uh, with some of Mary's questions, how much turf field rental revenue has been lost due to COVID-19? Mary, we don't know. It's a difficult question to answer because we, don't, we have no idea what would have been booked. So I'm sorry, I, I can't answer that question. There was no projected revenue and not knowing what would have been booked. I'm sorry, we don't have the answer to that question. So in past years, Mary has requested money to be set aside in the budget for the turf field replacement. Mary goes on to say, so when they need to be replaced in 10 or so years, the budget would not be so negatively impacted since the cost could approximately be $1 million or more. I was told the town, not the Board of Ed, would be responsible for replacement. The town would bond the money, which usually has a payback period of 17 years, and so the budget would not be severely impacted. Now Mary's reiterating something that I said, uh, and rightfully so, many times. You know, when we bond, it's usually for a 17-year period. So while Mary's saying, well, that may be true, due to the 10 or so years of needed turf replacement. Um, she goes on to say that uh, the bond will simultaneously be paid on the bond, there will be payments simultaneously for the second replacement cycle. So with all that being said, Mary asks, can some money be set aside in the budget for turf field replacement? The answer is not this year, Mary, maybe in future years. but. And, and this is, uh, Mary and I have had this discussion, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not that concerned about this because this is a good example. This year there was no usage on the field. I know that I'm setting the stage for the future here, years down the road, that the debt service here will be dramatically reduced significantly. That's what I'm planning for for the future. I operate, ladies and gentlemen, on many different levels, on a local level, a regional level and a state level. On a local level, when I look at the long term here, I am so focused on the day-to-day -day activities in the town of North Haven and this government, but I'm also setting the stage for the future, planning ahead so that our children, when they become at the point where they're starting their own families, and hopefully they remain in North Haven, they're not gonna be saddled with an incredible amount of debt Yes, we have a spike in debt because of the projects that we've built, critical projects, the middle school and the police department. But years from now, if and when that turf field needs to be replaced, yes, Mary, we'll consider maybe putting some money aside, but I'm not that concerned about it because I'm setting a stage for a dramatic reduction years from now in debt here. And that offers in the future great capacity for the town of North Haven, who's ever sitting in this chair, to do things and not encumber the taxpayers. So th this series of questions as I'm looking at it, um, I'd like to say that um, some of these questions don't really apply to this coming fiscal year budget because the middle school and everything associated with it was a bonded project that's already in the debt service line, ladies and gentlemen, that we're proposing this year. But in fairness and out of courtesy to Mary, I'd like to answer some of these questions as I'm looking at them here. Were the gym floors replaced in the middle school in the auxiliary gym? The answer is yes. What was the cost? 
Mary, approximately $300,000. What about the track, Mary asks. No, the track was not part of this project. Was any work done to make repairs or replace it? No, that would be the answer there. What was the cost? Well, there was no work done. Is all the money now spent from the middle school building project? The building committee is reconciling the account, and yes, just about all of it has been spent, Mary. There might be a small amount left, but that's still being determined. Has the town received the reimbursement portion from the state? The town has received a portion of the reimbursement portion. It, gets, it goes into, in stages. So that is something that will end up being reconciled. What was the percentage in the amount? I don't have the answer to that question, Mary. How long has the town been paying on the bond for the middle school project? Approximately 18 months to two years, Mary. Has the bond payment ended for the high school? No. We still have approximately six years or so on that. When will the town start paying on the bond for the new police station and updated communications? Well, that's kind of analogous with the middle school. Uh, we've already started to make those payments. And th those two projects, as I mentioned at the beginning, are reflected in the incremental one million and four thousand dollars in terms of incremental debt service that's in this budget so how many more years mary asked does the, does the town have to pay on the bond for the firehouses approximately seven years i'll take another look at that but i think it's about seven years mary goes on to ask how much has the covid 19 impacted the budget well actually um, we've really slowed down spending so the irony is it has not impacted the budget that much other than the COVID related expenses whether it be PPE or whether it be the hand sanitizers that I spoke about that we're calculating and we know we'll, again we'll get reimbursed for 75 percent of that has the town received money or will the town receive money for purchases made whether it be for PPE, supplies, laptops, for online schooling. Well, Patrick talked about what's happening in, this, in the school system. And the CARES Act is reimbursing the Board of Education for approximately $213,000. And one of the criteria on that is for technology. But the answer to Mary's question here is the town will receive the reimbursement what I've mentioned a couple of times here on the uh, COVID-19 pandemic related expenses reimbursed back to us and other municipalities uh, from the federal government and or the state. Approximately how much revenue will the town not receive due to the lowering of the mill rate? Mary's referring to the 0.33. The answer to that is approximately $1 million that we're giving back in the form of some relief to many of the residents who were not affected by reval in terms of the properties being dramatically assessed for more because of whatever improvements took place. Mary goes on to ask, we have heard that uh, interest rates have dropped. Can any debts or bonds be refinanced to take advantage of the reduced rates to save the town money? Well, we've been doing that, Mary. Ed and I refinanced about $565,000 worth of notes. Uh, that would be the savings, I should say. We'll be saving $565,000. And we're also working with um, our, our bond council. And Ed and I will be refinancing another approximately $560,000 over seven years. When I say that, I mean that will be the reduction over seven years. And it might be straight lined at an $80,000 reduction in debt service starting this coming fiscal year. Now, we haven't done it yet, so we haven't reflected it in this number. Uh, I'll double check that. Maybe Ed did. But the bottom line is we've been doing it. We did it the past two years. We'll be doing it again, and we'll get a reflected reduction of $80,000 a year roughly over the next seven years that's the plan i'm concerned about people not being able to vote due to the covid 19 pandemic if there is no vaccine by august or the fall can the town implement drive-through voting at the high school like the town of vernon did for its referendum <clears throat> uh, 
The answer is I'm not sure. A lot comes into play here, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you know, obviously, we're hoping for a vaccine, but the, the reality is it may not hit here, and it won't hit here by August. When we look at this concept, drive-through voting, we have to keep in mind that we, we need workers, many of our poll workers, as an example, who may have to be in a format like this, most of them are senior citizens. So we have to be careful and always evaluate the unintended consequences of what we do. The answer is we will consider it, but I can't make a commitment right now. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Uh, Mary, thank you for your questions. And we'll go to Nancy Barrett. Nancy writes, in the town of North Haven income budget for 20, 2021, listed on page seven of the budget book, there are four line items marked with an asterisk under the category State of Connecticut Town Government, <clears throat> which have a footnote stating that the figures are not available. The exact same numbers for FY 1920 were carried over to FY 2021 into that column. Do we have any updates that would more accurately reflect these four sources of revenue? The answer, Nancy, is no right now. Not Right now, the answer is no. We, based on the discussions that we've had with the state, based on the numerous discussions I've had with OPM, with the governor's office, through my presidency with CCM, we're being told that the intention is to flat fund everything. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit further as we move forward here. So the answer to your question, we do not have any updates on those four items. Let's go to the next slide. So Nancy writes, I was initially pleased to see in our proposed town budget a line item entry reflecting an anticipated increase in MRSA funding from the state of Connecticut, page seven. Now that, that's very true. The total MRSA municipal project allocation to North Haven has been tracking at 1.4 million each for the past five years, which is also very true. For FY21, the MRSA funding is budgeted at 1.8. That is the number we received from the state. However, the proposed town budget was prepared pre-pandemic. During recent press conferences, Governor Lamont and the OPM staff have stressed that the state finances are going to take years to recover from the pandemic, and that has lowered expected revenues 9.5 billion over five years. In addition, we could be facing a potential state budget deficit in a range of two to three three billion next year. That number, to be precise, is projected to be 2.1 billion, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, that's my discussions at the state level on that number. Given these disturbing financial predictions, are you still confident about North Haven receiving MRSA increase or even receiving MRSA at all in 2021? And Nancy goes on to say that as a reminder, in FY18, we excluded MRSA from the revenue budget. However, we did receive the customary 1.4 million. So let me explain that we have had several communications with the governor's office and OPM. I have in particular, and all this information I'm directly involved with. So I see it, I listen to it, I talk about it at a state level, and they're telling us, the state, that their intention is still to flat fund the municipalities. So now, what that means is that those municipalities who always got two million, three million, four million, five million, ten million dollars more, they probably won't get that, ladies and gentlemen. So we've got to live in a flat funded model. For us in North Haven, I'm good with that because we know what we're doing here in terms of controlling the expenses and 
hopefully getting back now to solid top line revenue growth. So the answer here is we are projecting it. Is there a chance that we won't get it? There's always a chance. There's always a chance in this fiscal year coming that something could happen. But I can tell you from Governor Lamont himself, who said to me he's going to do everything he can to avoid that. So we have to project what we're being told the intention is. And some of the other questions, Nancy and ladies and gentlemen, I'll get into what would happen if we don't get that and don't receive that money. Uh, next question from Mr. Charles Wickline. Mr. Frieda, the only silver lining to this crisis is the money we are no longer spending. How big will the savings be from closing most government buildings? Well, the answer is that the buildings have not been closed. They've been closed to the public, but we're, an, we're a government that provides services, Mr. Wickline. So we have a fully functional and operational police department, a fully functional and operational fire department. The Board of Ed is still operating on a distance learning program, so the teachers are still working. The public works, sanitation and recyclables, still every day on schedule. So the closing of the government buildings relates to the public and vendors not coming in, but the buildings are still open internally to conduct the nature of governmental business. So Mr. Wickline goes on to ask, did we turn most of the lights off, lower the heat, stop using water, lay off employees, and drastically reduce daily maintenance? The answer to that is that we always, when we look at lights, if as an example, no one's in this conference room during the day, these lights are off. The lights in my office may be on because I'm there. Stop using water. Well, as I said, the people are still in the buildings here, our people. Did we lay off employees? We laid off all the part-timers. Yes, we did. Those would be lifeguards and those would be other part-timers that, uh, that were working here. Did we drastically reduce daily maintenance? Uh, actually, we increased daily maintenance because I've been sanitizing and disinfecting these buildings in a rigorous fashion to protect the employees that are still working here. So we have a high-powered antivirus disinfectant that all these buildings are being done. Everything down to the individual offices, desks are being wiped down. So for the protection of our employees here. Uh, Mr. Wickline goes on to ask and say, school buses are not running. No spring sports, gasoline, diesel, and fuel oil prices have cratered playing fields are not being used. I have a rough estimate of $5 million we will not be spending. Will our taxpayers get our money back or will it just disappear? Well, first of all, it's not gonna be $5 million. I'm projecting a surplus anywhere from 1 million to 1.6 million. And uh, in this coming budget, as I mentioned earlier on one of Mary's questions, that 1 million of that projected surplus will be used and give back and given back to the taxpayers in the form of revenue. Okay, uh, Mr. Gary George, there are many questions here, ladies and gentlemen. I'll try to take them one by one. What accounts for the three percent, seventy three hundred and sixty nine dollar increase in the general government uh, selectman line? Well, that increase is due to uh, what is roughly a 2% salary increase. It also, there's an increase in overtime. There's an increase in some of the, the, the dues that we are part of, like with the Chamber of Commerce as an example. So that's what the 3% would be, all the categories within uh, the general government uh, selectman line. What accounts for the 13% increase or $59,190? in the uh, central supply services line. So that might be, Mr. George, um, a number of different things. And um, I'm gonna come back to that question. I have to think about that for a second, okay? Let's look at what accounts for the 33%, 238,265 dollar line in the personal 
policy expense. Well, that would be a booking that we do every year for contracts that have not been settled yet, Mr. George, that will be settled. Let's go on to the next question. Please explain the 6.5 percent, 399,000 increase in insurance and employee line. So that really is a health insurance quote that we received based on the claims history of our employees on the town side. So the explanation there is the insurance companies issue a quote for the following fiscal year based on your claims history for the, from the previous fiscal year or a portion of the previous fiscal year. There's actually a 13-month look back on that. Next question, what accounts for the 11.2% 40,250 increase uh, in the municipal line or the miscellaneous line? 75% uh, of that, Mr. George, is uh, a table setter for the Columbus Day Parade. Every year, a different municipality hosts the parade. And this coming year, it's our year. Brantford, Hamden, New Haven, West Haven, and other municipalities are part of this as, as well as we are. We're not sure if we're going to have that parade this year, depending upon how this pandemic continues to unfold, but that's the answer there. What accounts for the 13.1% increase in debt service? Well, that, Mr. George, is what I've been saying earlier. $1,004,713. That's the incremental amount of debt service in this year's coming, this coming fiscal year's budget because of the middle school and because of the police station. Why is there a 43% increase in the selectmen's overtime? Well, in the, in the age of even greater transparency, we're having more and more meetings and many special meetings. So when that happens, staff who attends the meetings and take, takes minutes, they receive overtime. That's why we're planning more meetings in this coming fiscal year, more so than just the, the normal Board of Selectmen meeting. On page 24, Mr. George asks, explain the 250% increase in central supply services, radio system maintenance and repair line. Isn't this a new radio system? <clears throat> and shouldn't any repairs be covered under a manufacturer's warrant? The answer is, it's not repairs. There is a warrant for repairs. Manufacturer's warranty is the word. These are the upgrades that are critical. We have to pay, whether it's every year, every two years, whatever the technological upgrades are for software and firmware to make sure the system's still robust for the future. That's what that incremental amount is in that line item. Explain the 105% increase in general facilities alarm lease line. The answer there is that's a lease that goes out to bid and that's a lease where the low bidder came back and there was an increase in the cost for this coming fiscal year. What accounts for the 108 percent increase in information technology dues and expenses? Well I think that 108 percent is just a I believe that line item on page 25 goes from 400 hours to a thousand hours. I can double check that. But it's basically a more realistic line item. Uh, it's a more realistic dollar amount than what was in there in the previous year. So Ed had recommended we put that in, Ed Swinkowski. <clears throat> what accounts for the 146% increase in the police dues and expense line? Well, there are roughly 800 police departments across the country who are CALEA certified. That is a tremendous distinction for every, any police department. If there are roughly 47,000 municipal police departments across the country, we're one of an elite group 1,800. So we have to book a line item now that we're certified uh, that is in that police dues and expense line item to continue to be able to qualify for the CALEA certification. Items on page 28 um, explain the 8% increase in fire, civil defense, emergency management personnel. Uh, that's a reconciliation of a contract 
uh, and the, it, that line item is reflected of the new uh, contract that was settled. Justify the roughly 2.5% to 3% salary increase for each selectman, finance director, the police and fire chiefs, public works director, when the rate of inflation is only 1.5%. Well, uh, no one's getting 3% on the department heads. There's two answers to this. Uh, history here in North Haven is that the department heads get <clears throat> whatever the raise is for the unions that the unions receive in that particular fiscal year. But even more importantly than that, the history of this, is that I see firsthand, Mr. George, the tremendous effort of each and every one of these department heads. This has been a very challenging time for this government and every single government across the state of Connecticut and all across the country. And coming from a background where I led companies, some of which were on the verge, I took over, that were on the verge of Chapter 11 and was fortunate to turn them around. And then I had other companies that were highly successful when I got there, and we continued to maintain that success. But throughout all of that corporate experience, I, see, I saw then what I see now. In every crisis, there are certain people at the management level or the leadership level that step up their game. And each and every one of these people, Ed Swinkowski, our police chief Tom McLaughlin, our fire chief Paul Janiszewski, Mike Maturo, Streets and Roads Director, Lynn Sadowski, Director of Public Works, all have stepped up their games even to a higher level. You always want to make sure you're taking care of your key people. And I'll go back to the fire chief for a second. Uh, in addition to how he stepped up along with everybody else I just mentioned. Chief Janiszewski has taken on additional responsibilities. He's spearheading a statewide recovery group, working closely with me and assembling that, working with the Department of Emergency Management Services. He and I work closely together to have North Haven bring this repository here on Lindsley Street, to have PPE that, were, that was dropped off here, working with the National Guard, working with uh, the Department of Emergency Services. That put North Haven on the map even more so, the fact that we were one of the municipalities. So I justify it by the reasons that I just mentioned. General questions regarding the town budget. Is the money being allocated in 2021 in the proposed budget going to a lockbox for the purpose of future replacement of fire apparatus and personal protective equipment? The answer to that question is no, Mr. George. There's no lockbox for that. Mr. George goes on to write and ask, given the deleterious impact that COVID-19, that the pandemic is having on the United States, Connecticut, and North Haven economies, what is your ex expectation as to how this will affect the town's revenue? What are your plans to address any potential revenue reduction that the town might experience during the upcoming fiscal year? Well, in terms of the first part of that two-part question, it, given the impact of COVID and my expectation as to how it'll affect the town's revenue, in the first quarter of this coming fiscal year, which would be defined as July, August, and September, the impact will be a byproduct of what we as the Board of Selectmen already voted on, and that is to, <clears throat> to delay or defer the taxes to be, uh, to be paid by October 1st. So there will be a cash flow impact on that that I'm confident that we could absorb. Uh, some of that delay in terms of revenue coming in will be offset by the, the banks who are uh, people are paying taxes through an escrow system with their paying their mortgages. So I look at it in the first three months, we'll have what we call, we, what we used to call in business as a drag on revenue. What are your plans to address any potential revenue reduction that the town might experience? Uh, two things. Uh, number one, uh, slow down spending. And number two, possible layoffs. Uh, Mr. George goes on to ask, in April, Vernon, Connecticut, held a drive-by budget referendum. 
Why is North Haven not adopting this method so that residents, not the majority part dominated by the Board of Finance and Board of Selectmen, can decide how our tax money is spent? Well, the answer is, <clears throat> very simply, we're complying with the governor's executive order, the one that I just mentioned earlier. 168 out of 169 towns are in compliance with that order, except Vernon. So that's why we, we want to be in compliance with what the state is suggesting. Okay, thank you, Mr. George, for the questions. And what we'll do, Mr. George, is the question that I didn't answer for you, we will give you an answer via email back. We've made a note of that question. I want to make sure we give you the exact and the right answer on that. So the next series of questions are from our third select woman, Ms. Sally Boemi. So Ms. Boemi writes, in this proposed FY 2021 budget on page 28 in the fire department, in that section, we see for the first time that money, 150,000 is budgeted for on a line item called contracted fire marshal consultant. In 2016, the town hired this contracted consultant, even though there was no line item in the fire department budget funding this position. According to year-end reports in the fire department section, this consultant was paid $62,275 in 1617, $89,992 in 1718, $96,100 in 1819, and 57,992 through the first eight months of the current FY20 fiscal year. The question then is that Sally's asking is this. This consultant mostly does the one to four year statutorily required fire inspections of existing businesses. <clears throat> He's not a town employee, although he has regular use of a town vehicle. According to Mr. Swinkowski, he receives a 1099, not a W-2. For three years, I have been complaining that this consultant was being paid without appropriate budgetary authority. The fact that you are finally funding this line item in this proposed budget, is that an acknowledgement that my concerns were valid? So there's two answers to the question, Sally. Uh, I, we didn't think your concerns were valid. But in the spirit of cooperation, we thought you had a good suggestion. And that's why we did it. Because we thought about what you said. I don't know if the concerns were valid. We had been doing it that way. We easily can explain it to the auditors. But you know, you make good suggestions. And the ones that you do that we like, we will, in the spirit of cooperation, you know, try to listen to your thoughts and listen to your points of view. We don't always agree on some of the things that happen here at our Board of Selectmen meeting. But this one, we said, you know what, we'll do it. Sally brought it up. It's, it's a point that we can work with, and that's why we did it. Let me see if I, I want to make sure I answered everything there. Okay. So this is a reval year, Sally writes. Changes in the mill rate are difficult to analyze in reval years. How much of the proposed mill rate reduction is attributed to the reval of taxable property in North Haven? So the answer to that is just about 100%. So if we didn't have reval this year, we probably would have had, we would have honored the commitment that I made several years ago. There would have been no mill rate increase. But what we decided to do is drop the mill rate and use some of the reval money or the reval money to do that. So our calculation salary about 100% of that 0.33 is a result of um, the reval increment. Some properties went up, some properties went down. The net of it is that increment we applied back into a mill rate reduction. The next question, what percentage of taxpayers will see, the t will see a tax increase despite the 1.1% reduction in the mill rate? So our calculations, this is a very complicated question but it's something that we've been really analyzing internally here. My estimation on this question is that a little bit over 62% of the properties or people here will see either a 0% or a 
tax decrease. 38%, despite the mill rate reduction, may see a slight increase or more. And that goes back to the reval process that I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. As an example, I used the deck analogy earlier. If someone put a deck in, a new patio, a new roof, and that happened three years ago, <clears throat> well, it wasn't captured five years ago in the last reval because it hadn't happened yet. So now three years later, after it was done two years ago, and I know there's homes in town that have gone through this, it gets captured and assessed, and the value of that and how it affected the value of the house may offset the mill rate reduction of 0.33. So we estimate, Sally, to answer it, a little bit over 62%. We'll see zero or a decline. Okay, let me take some time to uh, look at this first, and I'll read it. <clears throat> Referring to page 36 of the town's expenditure budget under debt principal interest, there is a notation that 328000 is being used from the debt service fund to offset the total debt payment obligation. The fund was established by the Board of Finance last year, and it is funded by bond premiums. In the current 1920 fiscal year budget, there was a similar notation but the amount used from the debt service fund was 1.4 million. At the BOS budget workshop in January of 2020, I asked about this particular mechanism of using the debt service fund to net against the actual amount of debt service payments. In the interest of transparency, I said the full amount of debt service should be reflected in this line item. And then the debt service fund amount should be included as a revenue source. <clears throat> Doing this would have no impact on the mill rate. At the BOS workshop, you agreed to my request, but that is not the case. You are still reporting debt payment as a net amount. Why? So, ladies and gentlemen, everything that Sally says here is true. But in the end, Ed Swinkowski, who is my number two man here in the government. He's a director of finance. We spent a lot of time micromanaging the finances of this government. He's a certified public accountant and previously audited municipalities with a firm that he was at. He came to me and said, Mike, you said something at the BOS workshop. I don't want to do it that way. Would you support me in keeping it? And I said, yes. So Sally, what this amounts to is, yes, all this is true, but I got to go with my number two guy who wanted to do it this way. This falls under the category that, what I mentioned earlier, uh, you come up with a lot of good ideas, we listen, and we try to accommodate you as best we can. This one, we didn't accommodate you, so I apologize, that, but that's the answer. So uh, Sally continues, uh, as a follow-up to my previous question, after using 328000 from the debt service fund in 2021, how much money remains in this fund? The answer to that, Sally, is roughly approximately $354,000. So Sally goes on to ask, what impact will the financial consequences of the pandemic have on the projected surplus for the current 1920 fiscal year? And do you anticipate any state or federal aid to offset some of these unforeseen financial consequences. So the first part of the second paragraph, the first of the two questions, the impact and the financial consequences um, will have a positive impact, ironically. And I mentioned a projected surplus anywhere from 1 million to 1.6. With some of the layoffs we did on the part-timers, some of the vendors that we didn't spend money with, um, that'll all contribute to that surplus. So the consequences, at least for this fiscal year, are none. And now bears watching, of course, like we spoke about in the next fiscal year. And I don't want to minimize this question because it's an important question. When I say the consequences are none, 
because, in effect, we slowed a lot of the spending down on or about March 8th, and we pared back the part-timers, and there were positions that weren't replaced. We've captured and accumulated savings in this fiscal year. So that's why I anticipate the budget surplus that I mentioned. But please keep this in mind. Here we are, May 14th, and the year doesn't close until June 30th. And then the auditors give us 60 to 90 days after that to finally close the books. But that would be my anticipation in terms of what the impact would be, and it will yield a, another surplus. Do you anticipate any state or federal aid to offset some of these unforeseen financial consequences? Yes, I do. Um, first and foremost, in the form of the 75 percent reimbursement. Secondly, in my discussions with state government, uh, the state's looking to try to get even more federal aid. And as an example of what happened today, the CARES Act from the federal government offered Connecticut a significant amount of money, and North Haven will receive $213,000 from the CARE Act. So the answer is yes. So looking at this question, we have five supernumeraries, <clears throat> all retired police officers working to provide security in our middle school and our four elementary schools. These five must be distinguished from the school resource officers or the SROs who are full-time active officers in our police department and are assigned to the high school. At the town meeting in June of 2018, in which we adopted the supernumerary ordinance, it was emphasized that these five people would only be working on days when school is in session. <clears throat> Our schools stop going to school in mid-March and will not return to school until next year. Are the five supernumeraries still being paid during this pandemic? So let's take the first part of that. Uh, these five must be distinguished. Well, they have been distinguished. So let me explain the way this works to the, the audience viewing in. <clears throat> There's one SRO at the high school, Carrie May Mayaki. <clears throat> She's a sworn police officer. So she works at the high school, and she's the SRO, and the supernumeraries fill in, it would fill the rest of this at the elementary schools and the uh, middle school. So the, in, in our mind, there's already a distinction in place. One's an active sworn officer, part of the existing force, and the others are retired police officers, still certified officers that are managing the schools, and have become incredibly popular, ladies and gentlemen, in each and every one of those schools. And some of them are longstanding employees like Bob De Palma, Mark Iannone, Teddy Stockman. These people have been part of the community for years and years and years. But coming to Sally's question, are the five supernumeraries still being paid during this pandemic? The answer is no. Chief Tom McLaughlin has addressed that and they're currently not being paid. Were they paid a little bit after uh, March? Yes, they were, but currently they're not being paid. Thank you, Sally, for your questions. <coughs> David Cohen, if I understand correctly, the mill rate is actually going down for 2020-21. Does that mean property taxes will be reduced, assuming all of their factors are constant? Well, we kind of covered this, David, but let me take a moment to explain it again, that all factors are not constant this year because of the reval that I mentioned earlier and the reval that every, every one of us have gone through. So property taxes will be reduced. Uh, when I addressed one of Sally Buemi's questions, I said approximately 62% will see zero to a decrease. So that is the answer to that. Now. Uh, Mr. Cohen goes on to write, if yes, why wouldn't we consider maintaining the current mill rate and increase the budget with the additional revenue generated by the increased grant list? Well, there's two reasons why uh, we didn't want to do that. Because I mentioned that there is reval growth. We have fully satisfied, Mr. Cohen, the needs of the government at this point. On the town side, 
and Patrick presented the Board of Ed budget. We thought during this difficult time, even though there was a reval that complicated it, that to offer something back to the majority of the residents, as it turned out, in, in the form of a mill rate reduction, is our way of giving back at a time when other municipalities are raising mill rates. I just saw one municipality, one of my colleagues, 1.86 percent. That's significant. That's, that's in that particular town, that's almost $500 a household. So, you know, we want to give back. We had a really good year this year. I'm confident in our ability to continue to effectively manage this government, no matter what the crisis is. And I go back to my other business career. I've seen it all. I've seen every single thing. I've been through it. Crisis management years, been through successful years. There is no challenge, none whatsoever, that this government and yours truly will ever shy away from and will not face with a high level of courage, confidence, and conviction. So that is the reason why, Mr. Cohen, we wanted to give back a little bit this year on the 0.33 mill rate decrease. Thank you for those two questions. Uh, David goes on to write, is there a risk of loss of state and federal aid due to a loss of state and federal revenue from the COVID crisis? Uh, we talked about that earlier. Yes, there is a chance that could happen, although we still are, com are going along with what we've been told, the flat funding, and I mentioned that a couple of times earlier. Has the state communicated to us on this point? I am in constant contact with the state. In my, not only my role here in North Haven, but my uh, vice chairmanship at our Council of Governments and my presidency of Connecticut Conference of Municipality, constantly in contact. What will the town do in the event of a loss of state or federal aid? Well, this goes back to Mr. George's question. We will slow down spending, stop spending, and there could be layoffs. Does the town generate revenue from property taxes only, or is some form of revenue generated from local sales tax? Strictly property taxes, no local sales tax, Mr. Cohen? Although there was a Senate bill a couple of years ago that um, was, was not passed that brought that concept into play that the municipalities maybe can get a portion of the local sales tax, but it never passed in the legislative body. So I want to make sure I answer all of what Mr. Cohen is asking here. If it's the latter, but the answer is not the latter, has the town given any consideration to loss of sale receipts during the COVID closure of stores and retail and how it might affect the budget for next year? Well, the answer to that is the same answer in the first part, because we don't get the local sales tax. <clears throat> the second question uh, becomes muted, so it, it's not really an issue right now. This question is from uh, Jennifer Caldwell. Has the cost of self-insurance increased throughout the pandemic? Not necessarily. The cost of health insurance has increased, not necessarily because of the pandemic, but because of a claims history that now gets reflected on the town side. And on the town side, that's projected to be roughly a 6% increase. The way it works is claims are paid in arrears, Mrs. Caldwell. So we don't know what those claims are going to be coming in, but I can't say it's, it's, a, it's a result of the pandemic. Uh, Jennifer goes on to write, what impact do you see on the cost of self-insurance next year? Well, we've projected, Patrick mentioned what he thought the increase would be on the board side. I just mentioned the 6% on the town side, but maybe because I'm a little bit more optimistic on the town side, what I'm seeing is that if the trends continue as they have been in the last couple of months of the fiscal year we're in, that 6% provided once again the trends continue the way they've been trending in the last couple of months here, that 6% may end up at 4.99%. But we we're reflecting 6 because that is what we were asked to put in by the, um, the brokers that we utilize, the health insurance consultants. So um, I hope I answered those questions, Mrs. Caldwell. Uh, Gerald Feinberg. Uh, Jerry is a former member of the Board of Finance. So Jerry writes on page 28, on the fire civil defense emergency management 
the line for volunteer recruitment, recruitment shows the actual expense amount for FY19 is 11905 Jerry goes on the right, and no amount budgeted for the current fiscal year and next fiscal year. Please explain why the volunteer recruitment line was zeroed out and what the town is doing to retain and attract volunteer firefighters to minimize the cost of the fire department. Jerry, um, if you take another look on page 28, I am convinced that what you will see is about four or five line items up from the line item that looks to be zeroed out. And you're right about that. There is a line item that shows zero. But four or five line items up from that, you'll see a $10,000 allocation for volunteer recruitment. So we changed the terminology of the line, and it is in there. It's not at 11905 It's at 10000 Jerry. But also keep this in mind, that the fire chief and I, over two years ago, met with each one of the volunteer captains, and we wanted to ask what can we do to help retention or actually recruiting even more fire, uh, volunteer firefighters. So without hesitation, the captains responded that they needed a fire training facility, of which we're working on as we spoke about here earlier. The volunteer fire captains uh, asked us about could we make sure that food was provided on a regular basis to the volunteer firefighters as opposed to having the volunteer firefighters go out and shop themselves and then bring the food back into the volunteer houses. And the chief and I, Chief Paul Janiszewski, we agreed to that. Then there was a, then there was a, a, a full court effort on trying to recruit firefighters that for some reason to get new volunteer firefighters in was not successful. But it looks like we would settle, we're settled in now at somewhere between, let's say, 32 and 45 volunteer firefighters in terms of retaining that important group here to augment the efforts of our paid department. So, Jerry, uh, if you check that, page 28, I think you'll see the $10,000 in there. And ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our questions. I'd like to say thank you very much for uh, joining us here tonight. I'd like to once again say that next Wednesday there will be a Board of Finance meeting. That will be a teleconference. And I'd like you to visualize this. We hope you will tune into that. For those of you that are old enough to remember listening to radios at night, you will be, you will be looking at this dais. There will be nobody here. And you will be listening to the dialogue among the Board of Finance members to go through this budget. And then, as we mentioned earlier, the Board of Finance will vote on the budget, and then at that point, the mill rate will be established. So I'd like to end the way I began. We are faced with unprecedented times, unprecedented challenges, and unprecedented problems. And this format tonight is a byproduct of that. But we must continue to understand that life sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, means making adjustments and, and making the adjustments to continue to try to move forward here or move forward in our daily lives and whatever we are involved with. But there's no doubt in my mind that all of that has yielded unprecedented hope and we will continue to do everything we can here in this government to satisfy the needs of our wonderful citizens and that unprecedented hope ladies and gentlemen I'd like you to look forward maybe to even early next year or mid next year we are going to have and be faced with a series of adjustments between now and that time frame those adjustments may be if restaurants open up People may be wearing masks. It's going to be not the way life used to be for a while. But we must have hope for a vaccine. We must have hope that there will be continued testing. And once the vaccine comes into play and we all start becoming vaccinated, that 
hope becomes perpetuated into creating more positive outcomes for us as people, for us as a community, for us as a society, and for our families. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining me this evening, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Have a good night. The preceding program is brought to you in part through a grant from the town of North Haven. Watch town meetings or other videos on demand at NHTV.com.